That prelude, that was beautiful. It is good to see you this morning. I want to thank you for being here, and I want to take this as a moment to welcome you to our services. I welcome those who've joined us by way of live streaming and also those listening by way of radio. I'm in the baptistry this morning because we have a couple of baptismal candidates that are going to come forward and pass through the baptismal waters, and they have some family that are here with them, and I welcome them. But I thank you for your attendance, and uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you and uh, may the Lord glorify himself through our service today. And uh, I'm going to recognize our baptismal candidates. Crystal, come on down. Here she comes. Crystal Fuller. Uh, we have Daniel and Crystal Fuller, and I'm so thankful. I've gotten to know this couple, and they've come uh, to our church, been visiting with, moved, moved into Dresden, into the town area, came here and have talked to me on a couple of occasions. And they came and uh, said, we just want to be baptized. We we're professing Christians, but we want to identify with him through the baptism of waters. Crystal is the head of the uh, food department. Uh, she's the one that keeps your kids fed every day at Dresden Elementary and Junior High. So you better thank her, okay? <laughs> All right, beautiful young lady. Crystal, in obedience to the commandments of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him as your Lord and Savior, I come now to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Crystal. And her husband, husband Daniel. Daniel works for AT&T, and uh, he travels. He tra travels every day from Dresden to Jackson, and then... Travels all over northwest Tennessee, and he was just telling me a few moments ago he's been working in Memphis area, and uh, so if your phones ever go out, call him, okay? <laughs> Daniel, in obedience to the commandments of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him as your Lord and Savior, I come now to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Oh, how great it is when the church baptizes and we see what the Lord Jesus has been doing in the lives of people. And let's pray for Daniel and Crystal and their families, and uh, may they grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the time together this morning. Thank you for Daniel and Crystal and for their family. I do pray that you will help them to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus and that you will help them as they serve here in this local body, in this church, Lord, we pray that as you have gifted them, they would bring all of those gifts and talents to our church to enhance your kingdom and your kingdom's cause. Bless this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. And this morning we fell off a little bit in Sunday school at 158 because of spring break, I'm sure. But we'll make up for it next Sunday, won't we? Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Well, good morning, guys. They're getting the tables, hand chime tables finished. We do appreciate the, the dedication, the hard work of those who play so faithfully, and Jeannie as she directs them. Well, for our chorus this morning, please stand as we sing together, Refiner's Fire, number 592, if you'd like to turn there. Let's sing it. Purify my heart, let me be as a soul, and precious silver, purify my heart, let me be as a There's no better friend. Just one page over. What a friend we have in Jesus. Don't sing this song often enough, probably. But the last stands of those involved in children's worship will be dismissed. Let's sing it. <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Take it to the morning prayer. 
worship are dismissed as we sing this last stanza. Are we and encouragement and solace <clears throat> well the choir is going to sing to you uh, a song that's very appropriate for this week um, on this Palm Sunday looking forward looking toward the rest <clears throat> of the week and certainly Friday when he was on the cross you can rest assured you and I were on his mind
or choir. Uh, that is a beautiful song. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind, and so were you. And it was at the cross that he paid our sin debt. And what a friend. I want you to turn this morning to the book of Proverbs. And there are two verses that I want you to notice. One is found in chapter 17. The other one is found in chapter 18. Just two verses, but there's a, a lot in each one of these Proverbs. If you would look at chapter 17 and verse 17. Uh, pardon? That was, my, that was my mind trying to get organized. <laughs> chapter 17, verse 17. A friend... Loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. Now look over to chapter 18 and verse 24. From 1717 to 1824, that must have been a good stretch of years. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, I'm sure that there's, this old world's full of counterfeit friendships. You know, I'm sure that there are probably people who are like bees. You know, the, the bees flock and, uh, to a flower and they, they cover, they swarm to the flower and cover the flower as long as the nectar is there. But once the nectar's gone, the bees are gone. It's like the prodigal son. He left home with a pocket full of money, a gleam in his eye, and a spring in his step. And he had a lot of friends as long as he was the big spender. But when his money ran out, his friends ran out, and he found himself in a pig pen slopping with the hogs. You know, there are some people that if you have money, they'll latch on to you for your money. If, they'll, if you have fame, they'll latch on to you for fame. If you have any number of things that is advantageous to them, they'll latch on to you for what they can get out of you. But not all friends are traitors. Uh, somebody once said, a friend is someone who's walking in when the world is walking out. But I want to come to you, share with you this morning, not about just human friendship. We might touch off on that just a bit or two, but I want to elevate these verses to the highest level. There is a friend who loves at all times. He's a brother born for adversity. And there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now I'm talking this morning to the friends of Jesus. Are you his friend? Has he called you his friend? He said in John chapter 15, he told his disciples, he said, listen, he said, I no longer call you my servants, now I call you my friends. The Bible says that God spoke to Moses as he was speaking to a friend. In James, the book of James refers back to the Old Testament that Abraham was the friend of God. So it's possible to be friends with God. It's possible to have him as your friend and you be his friend. But I want to elevate this this morning to the highest level possible. The friendship that comes with Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. And there are four things that I want to share with you this morning. Here's the first one. Jesus is a friend who loves at all times. Look at chapter 17 and verse 17. See, the, underscore that word times. He, he loves at all times. Now, these things are not on the outline this morning but they're going to be on the powerpoint so if you want to jot these down what all does that involve when it says that Jesus is a friend who loves at all times first of all it takes into account his eternality you say what does that big word mean it means he's eternal Jesus said I have loved you with an everlasting love let me ask you friends of Jesus this morning let me ask you a question when did Jesus start loving you Do you know when he started loving you? Before time ever began. He started loving you before the world was ever created. 
Somewhere back there in eternity past, this is a finite mind trying to deal with an infinite God, and I can't wrap my hands around it. But somewhere back in eternity past, he said, I have lived, loved you with an everlasting love. He had his heart fixed on you. Somewhere he had impressed upon you his heart. You have been, been imprinted on his heart. Somewhere back in the eternity past, you were etched and into the palms of his hands. You were earmarked. He said, I have loved you from everlasting to everlasting. You were engraved. Now listen, you said, Don, how can that be? I don't know of any other explanation. You see, God's not bound by time and he's not bound by space. What's happening in your life 10 years from now is already happening in the mind of God. That's why he can prophesy with such precision in the scriptures. That's why he can tell us in the book of the Revelation how it's going to all end. I don't understand all of it, but because God has decreed it, because God has ordained it, because God has purposed it, he can tell you what's happening in the future. He may be preparing you for something today that you're going to be experiencing five years from now. When he says he's a friend who loves at all times, that takes into account the eternality of his love. It had no beginning. There's never been a time when Jesus hasn't loved you. Now, he loves the world, but he especially loves his friends. And if you're not his friend, you're going to meet him one day as a foe. But I'll end the sermon with that appeal in just a few moments. But not only does it take into account the eternality of his love, it takes into account the extent of his love. To what extent does he love us? Listen to me this morning. He arise, uh, arranged for your arrival. He arranged the day of your conception. I spoke on that a few weeks ago. He arranged for the day of your birth. He was there with his tender eyes guarding your cradle. He was there watching you as your lungs pumped and as your heart beat and as your blood pulsed, he was there all of the time keeping you alive. He was there who had ordained the day of your conception and the day of your birth. Here he was at the extent of his love. And yet even then, he saw all of your sins as a child. He saw all of your sins as a youth. He saw all of your sins as an adult. And he still loved you. He loved you still through it all. Now, perhaps there were... For some of you may have run from him for years. You may have cursed him. You may have blasphemed him. You may have said, I want nothing to do with you. It may have been for years that he toiled with you. It may have been that you neglected the house of God, the people of God, the book of God, the prayer closet of God. It could have been all of that time. And yet to the extent of his love, he never once stopped loving you. You remember a few years ago, there was a, I was watching one of the country music awards and they had voted the greatest country music hit of all time, written and sung by, or not written by, but sung by George Jones. Do you remember that old song, He Stopped Loving Her Today? You didn't know you was going to get a country music ballad this morning, did you? They placed a wreath on his door. It was an old boy who had pledged his love to this woman for all of his life and she said, oh, you'll forget in time. And he never stopped loving her until they placed a wreath on his door until the day he died. Listen, there never, never comes a time when Jesus stops loving you. He has loved you from eternity past. He loves you to the extent that even when you cursed him. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, the apostle Paul said, God who is rich in mercy has loved us. Even when we were, while we were yet sinners, he still loved us. He never let you go. And then one day, he began to work by his precious, tender, gracious hand. And he began to work in your heart. And he began to bring a desire to your heart, a desire you'd never had before. And that desire was for a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And he began to convict you of your sins. And he began to show you how you had offended a holy God. And then by his cords of love and his cords of grace, he gently, perhaps even violently, drew you to himself. And you, like the prodigal, said, I will arise and I will go to my father because this is to the extent of which he loves me. There's the eternality of his love. There's the extent of his love. But what about the example of his love? This is a friend who loves at all times. From eternity past, 
Even from the day you were conceived and the day you were born, He's watched over you and sustained you to this moment in time. But what about the example of His love? Listen, He couldn't wait. He had to speed from heaven down to this earth. Be born of the Virgin Mary, laid in a manger, lived in obscurity, labored in ministry. But that wasn't enough. He had to go languish. He had to go before a mock trial as we studied in Sunday school this morning. He had to go suffer all of the humiliation, the nakedness, the spitting, the mockery, the taunting, dying there naked before the eyes of the world. God himself who created man. And yet on the cross he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And yet he did all of this, went to the cross and hung there. Went to the Garden of Gethsemane and sweat as it were great drops of blood. Then went to the cross and shed his rich royal red blood. Wore the crown of thorns. Felt the nails. That's what the Bible means when it said God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And through it all, through the darkest hours, he's never stopped loving you. He loves at all times. He's loved you from eternity past. There you see the extent of his love from the moment of conception to birth all the way through to life to where you're sustained right now. And then there's the example of his love that's shown at the cross of Calvary. It wasn't enough just to create us, but then he had to come and die for us. But I want you to notice the endurance of his love. For those of you who are saved, has it not been since you have been saved that you have backslidden? Has it not been since you have been saved that you have drifted, that you've wandered? Has it not been since you've been saved that there are seasons when you have to admit, my heart has been so cold toward Him? My thoughts have been so vile. My spirit has been rebellious. And some of us have looked and said, you know, we're like the people of Israel when they came up out of the land of Egypt. I want to go back to Egypt. I had life better back than Egypt. My friends were loyal to me back when we were in Egypt. We had plenty to eat back in Egypt. We had comfort back in Egypt. I just want to go back. This life is too rough for me. Has there not been a time when you thought to yourself, I'd just like to go back to my old way of living? Perhaps there have been times when we've been dishonored his name. We have forsaken him. We have turned our backs on him. There have been times in our riches where we've said, God, I've increased in riches and I have need of nothing. But perhaps in times of poverty, we've questioned him. In times of sickness, we've slandered him. In times of trials and tribulations, we've questioned and second-guessed him. Has there not been a time? And yet, through it all, through all of the endurance of all of that, he has never stopped loving through all of the faults and all of the failures. There have been times when we felt so empty, we felt undeserving, we felt like we deserved nothing but hell, and yet he's never turned his back on you. He's a friend who loves at all times. But there's one last thing I want you to notice. Not only do you notice the eternality of his love, and then there's the extent, and there's the example, and there's the endurance. What about the efficiency of his love? Has his love not been efficient? Do you know where he is right now? He's standing at the right-hand side of the Father, making uh, making intercession for us. He's our advocate. He's our go-between. He's our defense attorney. When we sin, he looks at us and says, Father, look, the nail prints. Here's what I paid for those sins. Here's how I atoned for those sins. That's why Paul would write, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? For it is God who justifies. That's why Paul would write, There is therefore now no condemnation to the which are in Christ Jesus. God no longer condemns. He stood in our place. He suffered our due. He found us where we were. And he's brought us to where we are. But he's going to carry us further. For he which hath begun a good work in you will complete it. He will not deny it. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He says to his children this morning, to his friends, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. 
He says to his friends, have my, has my ear ever become too dull to hear you? Has my arm ever become too shortened to help you? Has, has my heart ever become so incompassionate, uncompassionate that I can't walk with you through the valley? Never once has he stopped loving you. He's a friend who loves at all times. Perhaps some of you sitting here this morning thinking, Don, I don't know how he could still love me. I've messed up my life. I've made so many mistakes. I've made so many blunders. Yet he still loves you. You know what he's done? He's turned us from aliens into citizens. He's turned us from paupers into heirs, joint heirs with Christ Jesus himself. And he supplies all of our needs, but all of our needs shall be supplied through God in Christ Jesus. He's a friend who loves at all times. But there's a second thing that I want you to notice. Not only is he a friend who loves at all times. Listen to me. He's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You hear that? He's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Notice over in chapter 18 in verse 24, the latter part of verse 24, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, while you underscored the word times, here's the word y'all want you to underscore here. It's the word sticks. He just sticks around. He hangs around. Perhaps you may not want him to hang around sometimes, but here is, he sticks with you. So I read a little quote this past week. said, a friend is someone that when you'd make a total fool of yourself, they don't think you've done a permanent job of it. <laughs> Here is the one who sticks closer than a brother. Now, what all does that entail? What all does that involve when it says he sticks closer than a brother? It simply means this. He sticks close to us wisely. Wisely. Jesus chooses his friends wisely. He loves his friends wisely. He treats his friends wisely. He deals with his friends when they're going through trials and tribulations wisely. He does everything wisely. You know, I think just, it might just been one day when God looked down from heaven and looked at me and said, Oh, Don, you know, oh, Don down there, he's got, that, boy, that boy's got a lot of talent. That boy has got a lot of ability. You know, that old boy, could, I, could, he could, I could use him in my kingdom. That old boy down there, man, he could enhance my kingdom so much. No. His love doesn't come from me, it comes for me. He's under no obligation to love me. You see, Jesus gains nothing by me. He has everything to lose by me. Now, he loves his creation, but he, didn't, he doesn't deal with me wisely because he saw what a great guy I was. No, he just deals with me wisely, not for what I can do, but for what he can do through me. But not only does he deal with us wisely, number two, he deals with us patiently. Patiently. Listen, he foreknew what he was getting himself into when he called you his friend. He knew what he was getting into when he called me his friend. He knew what we were going to do. He knew what we were going to think. He knew how we would rebel. He knew how we would backslide. He knew how we would fail. You see, he knew what he was getting into when he adopted into either, any one of us into his family. And yet he's patient with all of our faults. And even in our faults, he talks to us kindly. He talks to us respectfully. He talks to us considerately. But now listen, he's a friend that will always tell you the truth. And that truth is going to sting and cut many, many times. He will always be truthful with you. He's not going to play the games that we're playing in our game of woke society today. Well, you know, we, just, we don't want to offend them and we have to, we have to uh, be careful with our speech. Jesus is always going to speak the truth to you and me. No matter how sharply, how deeply it cuts. He's not a fair weather friend. He's not going to praise us when we don't deserve to be praised. But we are his children, we are his friends. And, you know, Jesus doesn't come to us one day and said, you know, I, I looked down there one day and, I, you know, I, I chose Don to be my friend. I chose him wisely, but evidently it wasn't wisely enough because, you know, in all of my patience, I have just discovered a bunch of stuff in him that I didn't know was there before. 
No, he already knew what was in me and he already knew what was in you. Jesus deals with us wisely. He sticks with us patiently. Number three, he sticks with us sympathetically. Sympathetically. He knows we are but dust to the ground. If you want to read a great psalm, go read Psalm 103. He pities us. He looks at us with such love. He looks at us from his throne in heaven and he says to us, listen, you're hurting yourself. Look at what you're doing to your life. And even for the child of God, even when we sin, he still looks upon us with kindness. Not that he doesn't discipline, not that he doesn't chastise, not that he doesn't make, maybe grow dis, displeased, but he looks upon us because he knows, listen, even that sin has been put under the blood of Christ. All of that sin has been blotted out. I paid for those sins at the cross of Calvary. And I look at my friend, I look at my children, I look at how they're hurting themselves, and I cannot bear to see them hurt themselves that way. So I'm going to step in and intervene. L l intervene. Listen, he's already always ready to pardon. Always move to forgive. He's always. Because never once has he stopped loving you. He's a friend who loves at all times. He's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Wisely, patiently, sympathetically. But he, he sticks with us faithfully. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He sticks with us faithfully. This morning, if you could transport yourself to heaven, let's just say for a time travel, you know, that happens in the sci-fi movies. But just say that you could transport yourself to heaven and then come back a, a day or so later and tell us what you discovered. Just transport yourself up to heaven and go to be and talk to the saints in glory. And just ask the saints up in glory, hey, can I, come here, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Did he ever fail you? Not one time. Did he ever forsake you? Not one time. Did he ever do you any wrong? Not one time. Did he ever mistreat you? Not one time. Did he ever abuse you? Not one time. You see, he's always been faithful. By his grace, he makes us penitent. He makes us, he brings us to repentance. Listen, he sticks closer than a brother. He sticks with us wisely. He sticks with us patiently. He sticks with us sympathetically. He sticks with us faithfully. And the last thing is, he sticks with us closely. When it says closely, uh, he, uh, he sticks with us, it simply means that he sticks with us so closely. You see, this morning, listen to me, you friends of Jesus. He doesn't see you as you are. He sees you as you're going to be. And you're going to be just like him that's what glorification is and we shall see him and we shall be made to be just like him but let me make a little side note here very quickly because this mark it down if jesus sticks closely to you as a brother always remember satan will not be far away as an agitator which brings me to the third thing not only is he a friend who loves at all times and not only is he a friend who sticks closer than a brother but the third thing is this, he's a, brother, he's a friend who's born for adversity. Go back over to chapter 17, and a brother is born for adversity. The Bible says, unto you a child is given, unto you a son has been born. Well, why was Jesus born? To deliver us from the fall, to come and bring us the hope of salvation, to come and bring us the message of the good news. Now listen to me, Jesus is not here physically, but his shadow falls on every one of his friends. Wherever you go, his shadow is there. And he sticks closer than a brother. And he knows every adversity we go through. He knows every trial, every tribulation, every temptation. I want to say this this morning. Some of you know him only by a profession of faith. I'm not saying you don't know him, but you know him only by a profession of faith. Maybe you're a new believer, a young believer, but you know him by a profession of faith. You know him just by simple faith. But some of you here this morning know him better than that you see you know him to be your friend because because he's been with you in the fiery furnace not only that he's been with you in the lion's den 
He's been with you on the storm-tossed sea. And He's always brought you through. You see, it's to your advantage sometimes to be in a trial. Because the more you're in a trial, the more you're in adversity, the more you know your advocate. He's been with you. You know Him. Talk to some of these older experienced people around here who've been through the fires. They'll tell you, there's never been a friend like the Lord Jesus to me. Never. Even in the moments of sharpness with his voice, he's always had a heart of compassion. He's never once stopped loving you. Oh, listen, here is a friend who loves at all times. Here's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. But he's a friend who's born for adversity. You remember the story of Joseph? hated by his brothers, despised by his brothers because he was bragging and boasting his coat of many colors and all of that. You remember the story of Joseph, sold by his brothers to an Egyptian caravan, going down to Egypt, sold into slavery, gets down there, falsely accused of immorality, of sexual assault, thrown into a prison, forgotten about for all of those years. Don't you know Joseph must have thought, what in the world is happening to me? And then the years pass, and his brothers that sold him come to Egypt to buy grain. And who should they meet but the man who has come to second in command, who controls the granary. They don't know Joseph, but he knows them. And you know what he said to them? You meant it to me for evil, God meant it to me for good. You know what, in essence, what he was saying? Guys! I'm your brother. And I'm the brother that was born for your adversity. See, I'm the one who brings you bread. And Jesus is the friend, the brother who's born for times of adversity, our friend, that he might bring us the bread from heaven. Not only is he a friend who loves at all times, he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And thirdly, he's a brother, a friend who is born for adversity. But there's one last thing. He's a friend who invites us to be his friend. I just told you in Exodus chapter 33, he spoke to Moses as speaking to a friend. Abraham was called the friend of God. The disciples were told, no longer are you my servants, now you're my friends. Now let me ask you this. If he's that kind of a friend, what kind of a friend are you to him? And what kind of a friend are you to his people? I dare say that all of us would have to admit this morning that none of us love at all times. Perhaps we're sitting here this morning with a heart of hate, a heart of bitterness, a heart of vengeance. I don't know. But a friend loves at all times. How much do you love him? Do you love him at all times? And here's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Do you stick closely to him? Do you stick close to your brothers and sisters in Christ? And here's a brother who was born for adversity. Perhaps you're going through what you're going through because you're the brother that was born for the adversity of someone else. What kind of brother are you? There's an old story came out of Washington. Sam Rayburn was the longest tenured, longest serving speaker of the House of Representatives in Washington. 17 years, I think, he served. Sam Rayburn had a friend of his, a family who had lost their teenage daughter suddenly to death. Early the next morning, there was a knock on the door. The man went to the door and there stood Speaker Sam Rayburn. And Sam Rayburn said this. He said, I just wanted to stop by this morning to see if it was anything I could do. And the man said, Mr. Speaker, there's not. He said, we're making the final arrangements right now. He said, well, have you had breakfast? He said, no, we haven't even thought to eat. He said, well, at least come in and let me make you a pot of coffee. Sam Rayburn comes in and goes into the kitchen and begins to make a pot of coffee. And his friend came into the kitchen where he was and he said, Mr. Speaker, I thought that you had a breakfast at the White House this morning with the president. And Rayburn said this, 
He said, I did. But I called the president and told him, sir, I won't be able to make it this morning. I've got a friend that's in trouble. I've got a friend that's in trouble. I want to tell you something this morning, friends. When Jesus came from heaven to earth, he didn't just come to make us a pot of coffee. He came to go to a place called Calvary. And you won't ever find a better friend than he is. I certainly don't want to sensationalize or emotionalize, but many of you know Miss Gertie Sheffield passed away yesterday. I was standing at the foot of her bed when she drew her last breath. And I thought, I've lost my friend. And what a friend she was to Jesus. And what a friend she was to this church. Vacation Bible school director, excellent teacher, servant of Christ. And I can only imagine when Gertie passed yesterday drawing her last breath, she must have looked at the face of her friend. For there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you that you want to be our friend. Thank you for being our friend. And when everybody else has forsaken us, you'll still be there sticking around. You'll still be there as our friend. Lord, help us to love you at all times, more than we have. Help us to be with people who are in adversity, to be a brother born for adversity. Help us to stick close to you. Lord, guide us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. Our hymn of invitation, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Oh, millions have come. There's still room for one. Would you come? Perhaps you need to come publicly this morning and open your heart and life to Jesus and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Be your friend. He'll do it. And perhaps this morning you're a child of God and you've drifted and you've wandered and you said, I wonder if I still even have, have a friendship with Jesus. Come and renew your commitment. Come this morning. Maybe you need to talk to somebody after the church is over with and we'll talk to you. We'll set up appointments, whatever. Maybe you need to come and unite with this church. We invite you. As we sing, would you come? The cross upon which Jesus died Is a shelter in which we can hide And His grace so free is sufficient for me And deep is His fountain, as wide as the sea There's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend, and have turned from the sins they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you though millions have come there's still room for one yes there's room at the cross for you the hand of my savior is strong hey, now you know they're coming and the okay. My Savior is long Through sunshine or rain Through loss and gain The blood falls from Calvary To cleanse every stain There's room at the cross for you There's room at the cross for you Though millions have come There's still room for one Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The cross upon which Jesus died There's a shelter in which we can hide And His grace so free is sufficient for me And deep is its fountain, the 
as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend, and you've turned from the saints they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome the sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through lost or in gain, the blood falls from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a few moments. Let me share with you and just those who've come forward this morning. And uh, Philip and Tina, come on, come on up here. Philip and Tina uh, Davis, they have been in my office. Uh, we've talked on uh, several occasions, but they both came. Philip's got back problems, and I know what he's suffering right here. But they have uh, been in my office. We, we talked for about an hour here a couple of weeks ago. And they both come as professing Christians, but they come from other denominations or from other groups. And, uh, but they're both coming as professing Christians and wanting to be baptized to become members of our church. And uh, Remy, come up here. Remy Kate Sloan. Remy comes this morning. She had been asking a lot of questions. Her mom and dad have been telling me that. But she came this morning. We just affirmed her profession of faith here at the altar. But she had received Christ as her Lord and Savior. And she comes and uh, to be baptized as well. And so all of this family is coming around here to be baptized. All in favor, give a hearty amen. Amen. And they will be going through our new member class with Brother Wayne, and we'll probably set that up in a couple of weeks, if that's okay. And uh, because next week we have our cantata and Eastern things of that nature. But uh, we, we'll all get all of that ironed out together, okay? So they're going to be coming, and uh, we're going to talk to Travis some more. And uh, I'm going to let y'all be seated back there, and Brother Jake's going to escort you all out. Uh, and uh, Philip's going to have to move on out right now. So uh, he, he's like I am. He can't stand up very long, can't sit down very long either. So, and uh, let's pray for them and this family, and we'll be setting up a baptismal service in the days ahead, okay? Uh, let me take this moment just to recognize Brother Jake, our chairman of the deacons, and uh, he told me right before we were coming out, I need to make a recogni uh, recognition this morning. Busy morning for me. Uh, so this morning and in the spirit of uh, the holiday season, we think about um, all that participate in the church. And when we think about that, we think about uh, women like Annie Armstrong, who went out and preached the gospel. And we think about Mary, who was the first to go out and spread the gospel. And we think about women like Gertie Sheffield, who were a warrior of Christ. Um, and all too often, we don't really recognize those women. But today, I do just want to read a piece of scripture for you. So in Ecclesiastes 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, it says that two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls who has no one to help them. And so we think about helpmates when we think about the church, and we think about two being better than one. But I will tell you that today we celebrate one who in her own right has done great things for this church. She has uh, been a part of women's mission and part of puppets and part of mission friends. And so today on Pastor Wife Appreciation Day, please join me in welcome and thanking Cheryl McCulley for all that she has done for over 30 years, not only being the pastor's wife, but being a faithful member of Jesus and a member of this church. Well, 
Yeah. I didn't know anything about that until this, actually late last night. Now, y'all be seated for just a few moments, but until late last night, and she asked me about it. I said, listen, I have no idea. I'm the last one to know anything around here. It's the pastor. They, they don't tell me. No, I'm, isn't she great? Listen, that's my second best friend, and I wouldn't be anywhere without her. And uh, she has gone above and beyond the call of duty, and I appreciate my wife. I appreciate her ministry, and I appreciate all that she does. And uh, she keeps the home running and has for years, and I appreciate her and thank you and love you and uh, for all that you've done. All right. Listen, what, before we take up our offering, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Daniel and Crystal if they will to be making their way down forward. While they're making their way, on a, another note, uh, I do not have the final arrangements on Gertie. As soon as we know them in the church office, we will send that out and let our church family know. But it's impending right now, the, um, the, uh, all of the things that are going to take place. Let me get down here. Crystal, we have a baptismal certificate for you and also one for Daniel there. And they'll have a new member packet and uh, all of the things you need to know about our church. How about a round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you all. Your family is where now? Your family is back over to the... All right. Good to see you all this morning. Thank you for being here. Now our ushers are going to come and we will receive the morning offering. And while they're coming, let me remind you that this Wednesday night there will be no uh, team kid. Uh, this is spring break. I think there was a look out over the audience this morning. It looks like a number of people have taken advantage of that. But this is the week of spring break. Next Saturday at uh, 10 o'clock, right? Is it 10, 10 o'clock, 1030 Children's Committee, the Easter Egg Hunt out at Wilson Park. Uh, check the uh, website for the exact time on there. But we had a big, big crowd last year, and we'll have a big crowd this year. So let's remember the Easter Egg Hunt. Brother John Johnson going to come and lead us in our offertory prayer. After that, uh, Brother Robert will come and we'll be dismissed. Hope you have a good day today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day you've given us. We thank you, Father, for, for just the beauty of this season and the changing temperatures. Father, we thank you for this, uh, for this uh, service and for how it's touched all of us. We uh, pray, Father, for this offering. We thank you for the privilege of, of offering. And for giving, we pray, Lord, that, uh, that we will all give with grace and that, Father, you will bless the offering, use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, I want to announce and remind you that next Sunday morning, the, the choir will present cantata. Uh, we've usually been starting at 1045. This is a little bit shorter than the other cantatas, so we would start at the normal time at 11. But please be here early. Uh, invite all your family and friends. And after we do the cantata, I'm very proud of the hard work they put in 
double time for the last 10 weeks. And uh, after that, the most important thing, Brother Don will bring the Easter message. Let's stand for our parting hymn, As We Go. As we go, may your spirit go before us. As we go, may we follow where you May we live what we have learned, share the message we have heard, and be alive to the world as we go. And you are dismissed.